Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to you all about assessment. Um, and so just to kind of give you some background on where I'm at right now and a little you know, tidbit that I think if you don't get anything else out of this session, which hopefully that's not true, but if you get nothing else out of this session, I think this is something that I've learned over the last couple of months that has been a real revelation to me with regards to how to conduct business and how to sometimes make a, a lot of progress. Uh, I just recently started working at St. Edwards University about five months ago. And one of the things that really stunned me when I got there was before every single meeting at the institution, somebody in the committee meeting would ha take a moment at the very beginning and have a reflection piece. As a Catholic institution, so sometimes it's scripture, but more times than not, it's just a quote or story. Um, and then the person kind of goes into a brief, maybe 30 second explanation for why they chose that particular quote, why they chose that particular scripture or story, and how it's relevant to the work that was going on in this committee. It, I've never been in more active and productive committee meetings than at St. Edwards because we've all been in the committee meetings where somebody comes in with a head of steam and somebody comes with an, an agenda and a gripe and they're just full there the whole time and they're just going at it. And you just kind of go, all right, <laughs> you know, try again next month and see how things go then. Um, and it, you know, it takes a lot of the negative energy out of the room. It focuses the entire committee to say, this is why we're here. This is what we're doing. This is the purpose. And it's, a, it's just a really cool tradition. And you know, a lot of times after a person shares the reflection, other people around the table kind of chime in and talk about what it means to them. And everybody kind of takes a minute or two just to kind of think about it, meditate about it a little bit. And it takes two, three minutes, tops. But it's just a great way to center a meeting, focus a meeting, focus an agenda, and to really have a very positive and productive session. So uh, with that in mind, I wanted to share two quotes that I uh, thought worked for today. Uh, Perfection is the enemy of progress uh, by Winston Churchill. Last night on the flight here, I was watching The Darkest Hour, so I, was, I got some Churchill uh, unbeknownst to me uh, before I got on the flight. So. Um, but I think that's really important, particularly when we talk about things like assessment day or assessment activities or um, you know, even continuing assessment dialogue. It's never gonna be perfect. It's never gonna be perfect. It is not in our nature for it to be perfect. Uh, it's going to be flawed and that's okay. Getting something out there, getting something done, getting something started is the most important point. And then from there you work to refine it every single time. It's, it's, it's an assessment process in and of itself is you get it going and then you move in the right direction. I've been on committees at different institutions that have been paralyzed by this desire to dot every I and cross every T before we implement something. That's, we'll never get anything done if we do that. So I, I think that quote speaks to this idea of assessment day and, and some of the assessment activities that I'll talk to you all about quite well. And the other one is not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. Uh, by William Bruce Cameron, the sociologist. This is a quote that's attributed to Einstein a lot. It's not. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I used to do one of my favorite quotes in politics. I taught political science for 10 years before I started doing assessment. And one of my favorite quotes in political science was Tocqueville's quote, America is great because America is good. America stops being good, stops being great. Problem is Tocqueville never said it, he never wrote it. Uh, it was attributed to him about 60 years after his death. Uh, and so I would joke with my class that I, after I die, I hope somebody says something really smart and attributes <laughs> it to me. Uh, and so this is kind of the same way with Einstein. This quote was attributed to him 30 years after his death, but yeah, you know, as a sociologist who said it. But I think the quote itself speaks to something that sometimes faculty can be resistant to when it comes to assessment, which is we're collecting this data. And this data does not define my class. This data does not define the learning that takes place in my class. And there are things that cannot be counted that count. And you know, having taught political science, I, I, that resonates with me very deeply because things like citizenship and efficacy and just being involved in your local community, these are things that really, really mattered to me after they left my, after students would leave my classroom. Were those my SLOs? No, but that mattered to me a lot. And if my students didn't do great on SLOs, but I knew they went out there and were more productive citizens and they voted, <laughs> you know, they would come by with their little voting stickers after the semester's over and show me that they voted. <laughs> that meant more to me than whether they could communicate orally well. Uh, you know, so 
I think this gets to a tension that exists at times in assessment with faculty and, and, and between faculty and administration. So I think it's very applicable for some of the things we have going on. Uh, so just to give you a little bit about my background uh, and the institutions where I've taught and, and been in an assessment position. Uh, so I was a faculty member at Guilford Technical Community College uh, and it was while I was there that I was kind of tapped to take over the assessment responsibilities. And the reason I want to show you this is one of the very first assessment conferences that I ever went to, I walked into a session, the title looked great, the abstract was amazing, and I sat down in the back row and this woman from Texas Tech got up and addressed the audience and she goes, we have 27 full-time institutional research staff. And I thought, I'm out. Like, this is something to, you know, 27 full-time institutional research. What, what planet are you on? Uh, I have nobody. And so, uh, you know, the ideas there were not necessarily something that I could implement. And so that's why I want to share this with you. So that when I talk about the experiences of these different institutions, you can get a sense of that's kind of where we are here, or eh, they have more, or they have less than we have. And so it just gives you some perspective. So Guilford Tech, 15,000 students. Uh, 330 full-time faculty, probably double that amount of part-time faculty. Some departments were impacted by that a lot more than others. Uh, 80 academic programs on five different campuses uh, throughout the county. Uh, so it was the third largest community college in the state of North Carolina at the time uh, when I was there. I then took over an assessment position at Florida Southern College, which is a Methodist-affiliated private school, about 3,000 undergraduate students, uh, 140 full-time faculty, significantly fewer part-time faculty there. Uh, so some departments, uh, particularly in the STEM areas, were impacted by that, but a lot of departments, 80-90% uh, of their coursework was being taught by full-time faculty. Uh, and a little bit smaller, obviously, only 50 academic programs. My position there was a brand new position. Assessment had previously been done just by institutional research, and it was kind of a black hole. People would do assessment reports, mail it off to an email address, and never hear anything back. And so my position was a new one, and it was meant to engage the faculty uh, with regards to assessment. And then currently in St. Edwards, I guess a Catholic affiliated private school, 4,600, uh, 220 full-time faculty, a little bit more in terms of uh, part-time than Florida Southern, 70 academic programs, and I'm part of a team, uh, seven-person full-time staff on institutional effectiveness and planning. There's two of us in assessment, two in institutional research, a vice president that oversees everybody, one person in business analytics, another person in planning. So it's a seven person team for that whole division. Uh, uh, St. Edwards, just to make note, is a Hispanic serving institution as well uh, and really focuses a lot on first generation students. So that's another uh, kind of piece of information about that school. So the, the two assessment positions mm -hmm. at St. Edwards, um, how do you guys break down those tests? Yeah, so I deal mostly with. Uh, faculty and with co-curricular activities and then David the other person on assessment it deals mostly with assessment of the strategic plan and assessment of operational areas so making sure and that goes back to some of our accreditation standards uh, that we have to make sure we're assessing things like human resources in the business office and etc so that's kind of where he is a good question. and by the way feel free to stop me at any point if you have questions uh, very important um, so some of the outcomes, the session outcomes for today, uh, contrast different communication strategies regarding assessment. So we'll talk a little bit about different ways to talk about ass assessment, different ways to frame it. Uh, how a design of an assessment day structure might look here at West Los Angeles. Um, to evaluate some different approaches to continuing assessment dialogue. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, and there's not one right way to do it. So whatever works best for the culture, whatever works best for the institution, that's all the way to go. Uh, and then to create a continuous improvement uh, action plan. And so that's something else which we're going to, I'll talk a lot about. How do you make sure that faculty are following through with the ideas of assessment? And that's a really big point. That's, that's, a, that's a point where most institutions fall short, quite frankly. Uh, and the numbers really bear that out. So the agenda uh, the presentation is going to kind of break into four parts roughly associated with those outcomes, talking about assessment planning and assessment day activity, continuing assessment dialogue, and then advice for continuous improvement. 
Um, we'll have plenty of time for question and answers. The group activity, depending on how many of you are here, we might just kind of adapt this group activity more into an open uh, Q&A session. Uh, so we'll, we'll just kind of play it by ear and see. All right, so framing assessment. So one of the things that I was really stunned by when I started working in assessment was how people communicated assessment to faculty. And it was frustrating for me as a former faculty member, and as a, at the time as a current faculty member, because assessment was spoken about as mandatory. It was the regional accreditation bodies are coming in, and hey, listen, I don't want to make you do this, but you got to do this. That was a lot of times the message from administration. I know this is a pain, but, you know, we got to do it. And so it was about regional accreditation or about state or regionally mandated, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the state structure coming in and saying something. Or for some of our career and technical fields when I was in, uh, at Guilford Tech, it was third-party accreditation, you know, welding, uh, you know, the welding program or the allied health programs or... Uh, you know, any number of other technical, you know, some of our automotive programs at the time had third-party accreditation coming in. So there, there was this regional accreditation, third-party accreditation, state mandates, and it was a top-down structure. Assessment was always some vice president, provost or president, standing in front of a group of faculty going, this is what you're going to have to do this semester. And there's not a quicker way to get faculty to not do something than to tell them they have to do something. Uh, I mean, that is a sure fight. You tell me I have to do something. I'm, no, I don't have to. What do you, <laughs> no. My mother, I'm not going to do it. Uh, you know, I, a lot of times I'll push back for that and, and naturally. And so that was the issue a lot of times. Additionally, there was no connection to students. That was, I mean, we didn't even say student learning outcomes. We just said SLOs. We didn't even want to say the word student. We would just say the acronym instead. So there's no mention of students. Additionally, this was outside most faculty members' expertise and experience. Most of us who are faculty went to graduate school for a specific subject. At no point did anybody tell us how to teach. They just filled our minds with a lot of material. And then one day when I was in grad school, uh, the department chair said, Matthew, uh, you've been a really good TA for a couple of years. Do you want to teach your own religion and politics class? I go, uh, okay, sure, I guess. And then suddenly, I, at 24 years old, I was teaching the 4,000 level religion and politics class at the University of Florida with a bunch of 22 year olds. Uh, and I wore a suit and tie to make sure that they knew that I was official. You know? And so that was, that was my way of creating distance in that chasm of two years uh, in terms of age. But it was, nobody had told me anything about educational theory. Nobody had told me anything about pedagogy. And so when you start talking about things like assessment, a lot of faculty have never heard this language before. This is new. This is not in their wheelhouse. And so you can't just expect them to jump on a moving train that's going, you know, 100 miles an hour and just understand everything. You've got to start at the beginning. You've got to build the faculty and the support structure up with them. So to make sure that everybody can kind of be on the same pace at the same time. So what are some ways to maybe reframe that. What are some ways to talk about it a little bit differently? One is to make it about students. I always joke that when I talk with faculty, if the word assessment or accreditation come up in the first 10 to 15 minutes of my conversation, I fail. I, I want to know about your students. When I meet with faculty, I tell me about your students. Tell me about your program. What are your classes like? Where do your students go after they graduate from here? Do they go to grad school? Do they go into the workforce? What are they, you know, that's what I want to know. I want to know about students. We'll eventually roll that into assessment. We'll start, we'll, we'll kind of transition into that conversation. But it really should be about students. That's why we're doing assessment. We're doing assessment to see how are our students doing, acquiring the key skills we want them to learn. And then if we see they're not learning it, how are we going to improve upon that? That's the focus. It shouldn't be about accreditation. It shouldn't be about regional bodies. It should be about students. As I said earlier, the fact that they're subject matter experts, I think that then feeds into this idea of helping them become subject matter experts on assessment, connecting them with the literature on assessment, connecting them with the resources that are out there on assessment, letting them know this is an academic field. 
I think that's something that a lot of faculty are not aware of. James Madison University has a PhD program on assessment studies. This is, they have an entire department on campus on assessment, academic department, faculty, to teach assessment. So I think playing into that and making a grassroots effort, bottom up, not top down. And, and I, that's one of the things I was really, you know, talking with Luis, that's one of the things that I really was thrilled about to hear here uh, at West LA is, it's about the course, and then it's about program, and then it's about the gen ed, and then it's about the institution, and, and all these things feed into each other. But making it about that day-to-day -day interaction in the classroom, I think is really important. So, like I said, putting students at the center, making sure that we provide professional uh, uh, opportunities for professional growth, and allowing autonomy within the general framework. It was funny, when I was at Guilford Tech and I, I started uh, doing assessment work, you know, I was very confined within arts and science, and I didn't know a lot of the faculty, and I didn't know a lot of the programs outside of that area. And when I went and talked, started talking to them, they all started their conversation the same way. Now, Matthew, we do things a little differently here. But every single one of them told me that they do things a little differently here. Now, the funny part was none of them did anything differently, okay? But they didn't realize what everybody else was doing, and they thought they were doing something a little differently, and that was okay. But the point is that sometimes it's good to have a framework, but it's also good to have a lot of flexibility there. And to go into a program and go, listen, these are our needs. This is the way our program is structured. This is the way our classes are taught. And is there any wiggle room in this form? Is there any wiggle room with how we're gonna do this report that works better for us? Sure. You know, and that way you're also getting more buy-in too, because it's not, me coming to you with a form or a report or a plan you have to complete. It's a discussion now. And it's saying, okay, what are your needs? All right. And then how can I adapt what we're doing to meet your needs so that it's most meaningful for you? Assessment should be easy and meaningful. I, I really genuinely believe that. So how did I go through? And one of the things uh, in talking with Luis, he wanted me to give a lot of examples of how this process might look uh, and how I've gone through this process at other institutions. So reframing assessment at Guilford Tech. We had a lot of problems uh, when I, right before I was tapped to take over the leadership position in assessment. The previous administration, unbeknownst to a lot of the faculty, had led us astray on assessment and we were coming off two straight monitoring reports by our regional accreditation agency. These were monitoring reports from our five-year review not even a full 10-year reaffirmation. So we were really in the, in the dark, uh, and we were just kind of wandering around. Fortunately, we had a new administration come in, a new president, a new provost. The provost actually came from out west. She was, uh, she was at Oregon and New Mexico before she came to us. Really strong assessment background. And she very quickly identified what the issues were and kind of reconstituted a new assessment committee for faculty. And it was at that point that we started the slow but steady progress of getting assessment where it needed to be at Guilford Tech. Uh, and quite frankly, assessment was something that most people didn't even understand. Most people didn't know their own SLOs. Uh, that, was the, that was where we were starting. Uh, so it was far, far, far behind where you all are. But most people didn't even know their SLOs, uh, let alone have an assessment plan for it. And so I met with every single department chair, coordinator one-on-one, -on -one, and I started with two very simple questions. What do you want your students to learn? How do you know they're learning it? That, that's, those are the questions. That's the essence of assessment right there. What do you want your students to learn? How do you know they're learning it? And, a lot of, and there were some departments on campus, I remember early childhood in particular, they had a lot of third party accreditation because of the state DOE and things like that. And they, I, when I talked to them, they said, here's what we want them to know, and here's how we know they learned it. And they had their assessment plan, and it was great. And so some departments, they had answers to those questions. Other departments, I remember meeting with some and just going, well, I don't know, the previous department chair gave us this list of program SLOs, but I don't really know anything about it. I don't really like them. <laughs> okay, well then let's, you know, let's change it. And let's make it something that you think is important. And so then let's put together an assessment plan to, to do that. But once again, it, it made the focus about students not about <coughs> regional accreditation. Yes, that was looming in the background, everybody knew it, 
But while that's there, let's, let's make this process more about students. <coughs> like I said, shifting the focus to show how this will benefit students. If we are able to identify what we want students to learn and put it in an assessment plan for how to measure that, then suddenly we can start to track the progress of students in their acquisition of these skills. And then we can start to identify when there are blockers. We can start to identify course by course when there are issues that start to pop up. Where are, where's the gaps that exist? Where are they missing these skills? And we can help students achieve at a higher level, we can help retain our students, and we can help ensure better post-graduation success. That was the focus, that was the, the sales pitch at the very least, and I think it was true. That wasn't just a sales pitch. So the other thing that I did at Guilford Tech was I very quickly discovered where my biggest blocker was going to be, and it was going to be the English department. The English department was the largest department on campus. It was the largest department inside the largest division. I knew that if I did not get the English department on my side, that the entire division was not going to be on my side. And if the entire division was not on my side, I lost the entire institution. So everything hinged on the English department. And one very crotchety 65-year-old Italian woman, okay, who was the department chair, who protected her faculty like none other. Fortunately, at the time, I was a 30-something-year-old Italian from Philadelphia. She was a 60-something-year-old Italian from Brooklyn. Uh, we both had the same birthday. And so we were good friends before I took over this assessment position. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, she would call me her paisan, and we would joke around a lot, and, it was, and we, we had fun. And so I knew I had a little bit of rope. But rather than hope and pray and cross my fingers that the English department would come on my side, I just, I knew I had to go right in, and she was the very first meeting I had. Uh, and I said, Joanne, this is what's going to have to happen. And I said, this is what's coming down the pike. This is how it's going to affect your staff and your faculty. And then I said, Tell me what you're worried about, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that I address these concerns, that I can support you and your department and your faculty. You tell me what I need to do to make sure this is okay. And so she talked at me for quite a while after that, and that was fine. <laughs> As an Italian, I'm very accustomed to that, uh, growing up in that household. So that was okay. And we kind of walked through and we, they were a very adjunct heavy department. And that was one of her major concerns was how is this gonna impact my adjunct faculty? And I don't, we're not paying them enough to make them do all these other things. And I get that. Because I had a fair amount of adjuncts in political science too. So I understood. And so we talked about what this structure might look like in her department. And I met regularly with the entire English department. They had bi-weekly meetings as a department. I was there at least once a month. Okay, just giving an update and just st standing there going, what do you mean? And if you just need to vent, that's okay too. And there was a lot of that. Um, and my office was right next to the English department. So I heard a lot of venting that I probably should not have been able to hear, but I heard it anyway. Uh, and that was okay. That was all okay. I also highlighted their achievements during college one events. Uh, I couldn't help but think of the show Parks and Recreation. I don't know how many of you have watched that show. Mm -hmm. There's a character in the show, Ron Swanson, who says, awards are stupid, but they'd be less stupid if they went to the right people. Uh, and that's kind of the way the English department is. They're very gruff about everything, and they're very, hmm. But then the second you kind of give them accolades, they go, oh, that's really nice. And so, <laughs> and so they, they kind of go along with it. And, and, and so I did highlight their achievements, and I highlighted their innovations. Every chance I got, Hey, this is what the English department is doing to try to improve the SLOs in their English composition class, you know? And then, okay, that was great. And then I was in a very unique position at Guilford Tech where I was in a lot of senior leadership meetings that even department chairs and deans in some cases weren't in. And so I kind of leveraged that position to be able to come back to the English department and go, hey, this is, I hear this is what's happening, you know, kind of informal, and kind of give them a heads up on some things. And so all of those things combined, you know, the, con the constant support, the kind of informal communication, all of this combined, English went from by far and away the biggest potential issue to my strongest assessment innovators. Because they're the department that is a, they're a gateway department at a community college. Everybody's got to take English comp. 
they're seeing all these students, and that's a lot of times where the best innovation and the best interventions are gonna take place are in those English classes. And so if you focus that energy in the right direction, that can be a, a huge asset. But it's all about engaging where you see that problem, not avoiding it. That's, that's a really key uh, element. I just want to continue. So let's talk a little yeah. bit about the adjunct friendly system. Oh, yeah. So what we did was we created full-time assessment coordinators for each class in English. So there was English 111, English 112, English 114, and then there was 231, 232, which was like literature, but that, a lot of adjuncts didn't teach that. It was mostly 111, 112, 114. Those were English composition, argumentative writing, career writing. And so we created full-time assessment contacts. Those full-time assessment contacts built shells in uh, our online, on our LMS. Uh, we were using Moodle. And so, <laughs> yep, yep, full-time. And so, they, and they just took that on as kind of college service. There was no release time or anything like that. It was just a kind of a mantle they took on. No stipend. No stipend. We, we were very, very poor. So, uh, yeah, no stipend. It was just something that the department kind of took on themselves and said, I'm going to serve as the full-time assessment kind of coordinator for this English 112 class. And to be fair, they, a lot of times for English 112 and one, for English 111 and 112, there were two. So they kind of split responsibilities. But they built shells in the learning management system. They developed entire lesson plans that they then just sent to the adjunct faculty and said, this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. Um, everything's built for you already. This is the assignment that we're going to have. Everything was very hand, you know, custom made and very, you know, ready for implementation. And it was not an additional burden necessarily that the adjunct had to, to do. And we also worked with our e-learning program to ensure that the collection of assessment data was very, very friendly with the learning management system so that they could enter the assessment information while they were entering their final grades so that it wasn't an additional step really they had to go through. Yeah. So how did adjuncts react to being told exactly what to teach? A lot of them were very okay with it actually. Okay. Uh, and because there were not huge changes. It was not so much the way, it was not so much what we were teaching, it was maybe how we were teaching it. Uh, and so there was not a huge shift all the time in terms of content. There was a little bit in 114, uh, I remember that. But a lot of times it was this is how we're going to reframe this or we're going to spend more time on this, we're going to really hone in on this one particular section in this course a little bit more than we have in the past. And a lot of adjunct faculty, it, it, I should note, at Guilford Tech, even though it was you know, kind of in, no, it's not rural, but kind of suburban North Carolina, it's probably pretty similar to the environment you see here. We had, I think it was 15 higher education institutions within an hour drive of us. So our adjuncts were driving all over the county, all over the state, you know, collecting classes along the way. And so they were thrilled when somebody said, hey, we built this, you know, section of a course for you. They go, great, one less thing I have to worry about. Uh, so, and, and the other thing that which I'll touch on later is that English department had a very, very close knit connection with their adjunct faculty. It really was a family structure in that department. Uh, and the department chair, you know, I joked about her earlier. She really had a lot to do with that and creating a really strong culture of collaboration and family within that community of full time and part time uh, uh, adjunct population. But a really good question. Yeah. You mentioned taking the time to find out what was working and what they wanted to see differently. Do you think that made a big shift versus you know taking and, and you know taking? I know when you have um, faculty that are part time, full time, and how did you do that to so people got them you know received the message? Yeah, so that was uh, I mean largely the, the the message was getting received by full time faculty and then being parlayed to part time. Um, one of the things that I mentioned a little bit later, but I'll talk about now, is the department chair in English would uh, provide lunch for during department meetings. And so it was a way to get adjuncts to department meetings. Hey, you teach this 11 o'clock class. Hey, stay for an hour. We got lunch for you. That sort of thing. And so it was a way to make sure that adjuncts were in the room when I was talking with them about assessment and talking to the department about assessment, 
So that really helped. Uh, that was something that our psychology department there also adopted, uh, this idea of kind of having uh, department meetings over lunch hours and, and kind of having a, being a working lunch, way of bringing in more of the adjunct faculty population. But I think it, it made a huge difference. The other thing that just informally helped, and this is, it's just coincidence in a lot of ways, it wasn't a plan, but my office was right across from the adjunct office. And so I was always in and out of there, and I was always a really available resource for them to just kind of pop over and go, hey, what's up with this, you know, or something along those lines. So it, it helped to have me kind of right in the middle of all of it as well. I think that happens. It's almost like, like we're doing track dev, like we were doing more assessing like our process, like and asking feedback for, okay, mm -hmm. should we start this process, what's working, what's not working, mm -hmm. how do you change things, it kind of yeah. empowers people to feel part of the process, but Absolutely. it's just not putting stuff on them. Exactly. Exactly, and, and that was the other thing, is we were using Compliance Assist, which is not all that dissimilar from Track that. Uh, and that was another thing, which a lot of faculty, when they started using Compliance Assist, well, this part doesn't really make sense for me, or this part doesn't work for me. And so one of the things that I would do is develop kind of a, a very general worksheet for them to use. And they could kind of go in a lot of different directions on that worksheet. And I would say, just upload it into, you know, rather than sitting there and worrying about, I got to fill out this field, this field, this field, just upload this document and that way we'll have it. And it'll work for you that way. And it, once again, it was kind of, and, and then I would kind of go back to compliance assist and complain to them about, well, the faculty don't like this or that, you know. And so we could, we, you know, we, and we developed some modifications and that sort of thing. So, but I agree with you about that. The more you can engage them about what's working and what's not working, the more it's a two-way conversation rather than here's the form and, and have fun. <laughs> Sort of thing. Yeah. Great questions. All right. Uh, so a couple of takeaways. One, I offer to provide support. Most faculty, once they are brought up to speed on assessment, won't necessarily reach out for additional support, but they want to know it's there. Uh, and so every single email, every single communication I ever sent out, I would end by, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I'm happy to meet any time you'd like. Just, just knowing that support's there, knowing that they can walk down the hall and talk to somebody about this, or complain, or just you know vent on a bad day, that's fine. But offer to always be there. Uh, constant and consistent communication. Uh, this became easier when I was at Florida Southern and St. Edwards because really I was the only voice for assessment. But when I was at Guilford Tech, I was just the chair of a much larger faculty committee. So that was a process of making sure that everyone on the committee spoke with the same voice, even though obviously it's coming from different people. Uh, and that was just regular meetings and making sure we agree on the communication and making sure that everybody kind of follows the party line, so to speak, within that committee. Um, but also consistent communication. Assessment should not be something that's talked about three weeks before the end of the semester, when it's, hey, everybody, hope you've done assessment because we got to get your artifacts submitted and you got to get this report done or at the beginning of the semester. Um, I send out emails probably every two, three weeks, uh, just updates about assessment. Sometimes they're not even updates about assessment. Sometimes I'll just send an article about assessment to department chairs or to faculty. Uh, and just to make sure it stays in their radar. Uh, and that's a, that's a really important point. I also, <laughs> I also have a lot of accidental run-ins with people on campus where I plan to accidentally bump into them when I've not heard from them in a while, because uh, I know where they teach. And so <laughs> I'll just kind of bump in, oh, hey, Joe, how you doing, you know? And then I'll, t oh, no, no, once again, don't talk about assessment, <clears throat> how your class is going, how's this, how's this? And then after five minutes, they go, by the way, I've been meaning to email you about assessment. Have you? Great, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, from there you can go into that. So you've got to be creative sometimes, but that's certainly another way to make sure uh, that, that communication is consistent, and that's all about there. Um, make your problems your solutions. Engage the most outspoken critics. Find common ground. One of the things when uh, I started getting more control over who was on the assessment committee at Guilford Tech, I started purposely picking people that I knew were mm, a little anti-assessment. I wanted them on that committee. I wanted to hear those voices, because otherwise, it's, it, you really start getting into group thing if you just have a bunch of true believers around the table going, yes, assessment's great, we all know this, we're all kind of totally on board. That's, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I want to hear complaints. I want to hear 
from the naysayers. I want to hear, you know, about you know those departments that have a lot of adjunct faculty that are complaining this is unfair, this is too much of a burden. I want to hear about that. So engaging those critics, I think, is important, and also it starts to. I think they have a release valve, and, and they, they have a release mechanism for those complaints. Rather than having it pent up over time, there's a constant source of communication <coughs> for them, and that by itself will start to lessen some of those complaints. And then identify your superstars. One of the things that I discovered very quickly uh, at Guilford Tech was we had a fair number of faculty who had taught at the high school level previously. They were my assessment superstars because they got assessment. They had been doing assessment for uh, years, and so they understood what assessment was all about, and they were a great, they were a wonderful source of, um, of support and of leadership within their departments. And, and a lot of them weren't in leadership positions, but they were really doing a wonderful job uh, with regards to spreading the word and identifying key issues and helping other faculty understand the issues of assessment because they had such a wealth of experience before. Also, my career technical faculty tend to be a lot stronger in that area, too, because they've worked in the private industry and had experience with assessment. And might have looked a little different, but they understood the mechanisms of assessment. So a few other recommendations. These are things I've also learned from Florida Southern and St. Edwards. Uh, emphasize that faculty assess constantly. I assess for them, you know, 30 seconds of walking into the classroom, you assess body language. Right? I mean, there's not one instructor in here who has talked to a class who within 30 seconds hasn't identified who slaps down, who's perked up, who's giving good body language, who's nodding when you make a point, who's looking at you like you're talking in a foreign language, right? And you go, and, and you sit there and you go, you know, especially a lot of times I had kind of loosey-goosey classes, and so I'd make a joke, and i go, okay, that did not land well, we're gonna try some different sense of humor next time around, or I just made a, I just, you know, provided an example to illustrate this point, and yet I'm seeing a lot of confusing, uh, you know, a lot of con uh, confusion on people's faces, maybe I need to make another, you know, okay, I'll just keep going with this and kind of figuring it out. So, as faculty, we are assessing constantly. We are evaluating the impact of a new section we've added to a course. We're doing end of semester postmortems. That's what we do this time of year, right? I've never once in my career taught a course, and at the end of the course said, Nailed it. That was awesome. Standing ovations all around. All right? Never once. Ever, and it didn't matter how great the teaching evaluations were that I got back. I knew at the end of the semester, ugh, that section on political parties could have been a lot better. You know? They did not understand how a bill becomes a law despite me showing them the conjunction junction video. Right? <laughs> it was, it just did not help. And so those were the sorts of things that we do naturally. And so emphasizing that the fact you're doing this already is just about documenting it and then following up and showing that how you improve it. That's all. But we as faculty are assessing constantly in every class we've ever taught. The other thing that I, and I emphasized this earlier, showing that, uh, that assessment is a discipline. Uh, and these are some links, and I provided the PowerPoint to Luis and Scott, and so this is one of those things, feel free to click on these links. This is a link to a wonderful article we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, this is a link to the University of Hawaii at Manoa's assessment page. They have wonderful assessment resources, probably the best uh, in the whole country in terms of publicly available assessment resources. They highlight the accomplishments of their faculty. They have great presentations up here. It's really wonderful. And they also highlight national achievements and resources that are out there. This is a link to an um, assessment commons uh, website that's got tens of thousands of assessment resources from institutions all across the country. Uh, so really great stuff. So planning assessment day. Uh, this has become a very chic thing to talk about and to do. Uh, I know Luis you know, sees the University of Kentucky assessment listserv. This is a topic of conversation usually every semester on that listserv. Everybody says, oh, I'm going to do an assessment day at my institution. What, we, what should I do? We had an assessment day at Guilford Tech. We did not have assessment days at Florida Southern, and we don't have them at St. Edwards. And so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is what an assessment day might look like, but what an assessment day might look like when it's not really an assessment day. Uh, because it doesn't ha you don't, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution here. Um, so what are some of the necessities, or uh, strong <laughs> you know, uh, 
strong needs, not necessarily absolutes, but um, uh, some really strong things that we should have. First, time built into the academic calendar or regular college business for this sort of an event, if you're gonna do an assessment day. Uh, I just found that not a lot of classes are taught on Fridays, I mean, or, or Fridays during the semester, potentially a good time to do this. Uh, at Guilford Tech, I'll talk about how the day, two days before classes start, we had an all faculty convocation that was mandatory for all faculty to be there. I understand that's probably not quite as easy here, uh, just with some of the uh, contractual obligations, but are there certain days that we can build into the academic calendar or certain times, even a half day, we can build into the academic calendar to focus on this and to make sure that we have mandatory or near mandatory uh, or near 100% participation of full-time faculty. Um, physical space, making sure that we have enough space for an all-faculty meeting, and that's important. Making sure the faculty are comfortable. Uh, and then making sure we have a lot of smaller rooms nearby for breakout sessions. Once again, very, very important. Uh, and then having a diverse agenda. Nobody wants to go to an assessment day that is three hours of presentations, and then you just get up and leave. Uh, that's not, an, that's a conference. And that's not always very fun. So making sure that you have a diversity there, making sure there's presentations, that there's workshops, that there's breakout sessions, that you have a lot of different people talking too. That it's not just your one or two assessment leaders, that it's people giving testimonials or examples from their departments or their class uh, about what they've done, okay? And highlight the work that's being done in all the areas of the college. Really make sure it's very democratic in that regard, uh, that everybody gets a little slice of the pie. For the breakout sessions themselves, uh, I would typically encourage three to four groups of six to eight faculty in a room. That works out to about 20 or 30 faculty. Uh, I'd always kind of prefer the low end, 20 or so. Uh, but get them in a room, a lot of times by department. Uh, so you might have, depending on department size, you might have two or three departments in a room together. I, I think that's good. You want to try to get as many departments in one room together as possible. Um, and then have some moderators, have some facilitators. Preferably other faculty, assessment peers, sometimes deans uh, or department chairs, but have some other people there to be facilitators. Keep faculty focused and on task. Uh, that was something that when I was just a faculty member, I was always guilty of that because usually these events happen the first day back from summer, and I just wanted to talk to everybody and just chat about how every summer was and vacation plans and that sort of thing. I didn't want to talk about anything else. Uh, and so it's important to just keep people on task. Um, and get them working and talking about assessment within their class, within their department, and then eventually get them to report out to the larger group. And this is why it's important to have multiple departments in there. And a lot of times really diverse departments. So having allied health in there with chemistry, in there with welding, okay? To give an extreme example. Because the allied health, the chemists, and the welders all think about issues differently. And they could all be presented with the same assessment data, they're all gonna come up with different solutions. And then getting them to share those ideas with each other. This is what we're doing to help our assessment. This is what we're gonna do, okay? And then kind of mix up the group afterwards. So mix the you know, allied health people in with the chemists, get the welders talking to the allied health people, and kind of doing the same process over again kind of working through this together, and so learning from each other, rather than working in this very isolated section where everybody kind of thinks alike or kind of approaches problems the same way. So practically speaking, what did this look like uh, when it came time to actually do this at Guilford Tech? Well, like I said, we had a beginning of the year convocation event that was really a state of the college platform. Uh, all full-time faculty had to attend, uh, and it was really, just a bunch of senior administrators standing in front of a podium for 15 or 20 minutes at a time telling about one particular area of the college and the next and the next and the next, and the president would address kind of the state of the institution for an hour. And everybody was kind of, uh, and everybody was wanting to work on their syllabi, and a lot of faculty had their laptops out and were frantically building their course in, the, in, in, you know, in their learning management system because uh, it's two days before the semester, so of course we haven't done anything over the summer. Uh, or we, we thought a lot about things over the summer, but we didn't actually do them. And so, it was, you know, it was always kind of a very perfunctory event that we had to go to. Uh, when the new administration came in, they realized two things. One, this was kind of a wasted opportunity uh, for engagement. And two, they realized their own budgetary restraints. They realized we didn't have money to send faculty to a lot of professional development sessions and professional development opportunities. So rather than 
spending a lot of money trying to send one or two people out to different conferences, why don't we bring professional development here and have everybody engage in professional development at one time? And so really those convocations became professional development sessions and assessment became a really big focus of those. So the logistics at Guilford Tech, there was one space on campus that fit all the full-time faculty. It was probably the least collaborative space you could imagine. It was just this very vaulted auditorium uh, and everybody sat in the back. It was like you were in a Methodist church. Everybody just sat in the back and nobody sat in the front. Uh, everybody sat in the sides and then if you came in late, you had to excuse yourself and get through 50 people to get to the middle uh, or people just kind of stood or sat on the, the aisles. It's very embarrassing. Uh, but it was, that was the space. And fortunately, that was in an academic building where there were a ton of smaller classrooms around the auditorium. And so that's where we had the breakout sessions in rooms kind of this size, uh, maybe a little bit smaller. And so this is where we would have 20, 30 faculty and we would assign it by division or department uh, or just randomly. And so we also kept the senior administration portion of the event to less than an hour. Uh, I had a very frank conversation with the president uh, and basically said, listen, you know, 15 minutes, <laughs> it's all you're getting. And so, because I, I put the agenda together, that's uh, what I allotted. And the vice president of instruction, she was great because she was not the type of person who liked to go on and on. And so she was like, she's like, give me 30 seconds. I'll be in and out and moving on with life. And so, great. So we could really keep that section of the agenda to a very minimal portion. Uh, myself and my co-chair uh, would give kind of an introductory presentation, lay out the agenda, talk about some different things, bring other faculty members up, highlight their achievements, have them talk about things a little bit. And then we would dismiss faculty into breakout sessions for about an hour and a half. So it was really a half day activity. It was typically kind of presentations, um, you know, kind of uh, best practices at the institution for maybe the first hour and a half and then breakout sessions for the second hour and a half. And so the breakout sessions, like I said, faculty were assigned classrooms, uh, at least one assessment leader whether it was a member of the assessment committee or whether it was somebody who just had a lot of experience with assessment, was the leader to facilitate. Faculty were given the assessment data from the previous semester when they came into the room. So there to greet them, you know, and so we had a pretty quick turnaround, even fall to spring, because this happened every semester. So when they would come back in the spring semester, there was the assessment data from the fall that they had entered. Uh, and so the assessment data was there. Uh, they would work and uh, put together an assessment plan or an assessment report, depending on the needs at that time. Uh, designated department representative kind of became the quote unquote assessment contact. Uh, and then departments shared ideas with each other. And that was a really big part of this, is getting departments to talk to each other about assessment, realizing that there were similar problems that they were facing, realizing that there were creative solutions out there, and then finally plans uh, and reports were submitted by hand or by email at the end of the session. That was the way we ran it the first time around. Remember, perfection is the enemy of progress, all right? This was less than perfect the first time around. Uh, there were a lot of bumps. I remember my co-chair was a welder, and he was in the welding, he was an instructor in the welding program. And I just, the day before this event, he looked, he was this real big guy, six foot four, broad shoulder, exactly what you would envision when you think of a welder, okay? And he looked pale <laughs> and looked, because he had never spoken in front of more than 10 people in his life. And so suddenly he's addressing all the faculty and it was a really nerve wracking experience for him. And he had never organized something like this. And I had a little bit more experience with this on, on being in politics and so, and being on the political side of things sometimes. But still, he looked nervous. I said, Don, tomorrow's gonna come and tomorrow's gonna be over. And when it's over, Kind of figure out what we did right and wrong. I said, but 24 hours from now, you and I will be sitting down having a beer, discussing all of this, and it's going to be okay. Uh, and it was. I mean, it, there was hiccups galore uh, the first time around, and that was okay. But 24 hours later, Don and I were having a beer and talking about and laughing about things, and it was okay. Uh, and so, whatever permutation this might take at West Los Angeles, it's okay. It just get something out there and get something moving, and that's a, that's a really big piece of advice. So what did we learn? Can I? Can you oh yeah, point? absolutely. That's the last point. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm confused by. Yeah, yeah. All plans and reports were submitted by hand or email at the end of the session. Yep. Plans created at 
the assessment at the at the breakout at the day? Yep. So we had we what we did was we turned our assessment software into a worksheet basically. Okay. And had faculty writing in plans and writing in you know assessment data results and because we had everything tallied and aggregated for them when they kind of came in so there wasn't we had done a fair amount of the kind of uh, quantitative grunt work and then they were just kind of reporting it uh, back but yeah so they were they were kind of writing collaboratively about different ideas they might use to you know implement continuous improvement and uh, yeah different strategies. So not about yeah. their particular class but how to improve the system. Uh, no, about how to improve their class. Okay. Yeah, that was the, yes, I'm sorry, that was the focus. Yeah. Sure the faculty member who attended received assessment data for their course? Yep. Each faculty member received assessment data in two ways. They would receive it by their course, and then the way that we were doing it, we would also aggregate by the overall course. So to say, uh, English 111 is a good example. So if I was to, or even, I'll just use mine, political science 120 American government. I taught five sections. I can see here's my five sections in the data and the Excel sheet, mm -hmm. but then here's the 10 sections that are being taught by adjuncts. And so then I'm aggregating all of those political science 120 sections to show overall for the course how are students performing. But then I can see my five sections and aggregate that as well. So I would see my course level and the kind of overall you were course. putting all that into, a, into a, an Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. from track then? Uh, no, from our learning management system. And that's where people would enter assessment data in the learning management system. We would extract that data into an Excel sheet, and it would be a kind of a master sheet with every single course and all the assessment data that was entered. And then I would go through and kind of clean it up, essentially, and create individual spreadsheets for each course at each department on campus. So based on your assessment from the previous semester? Yeah. Okay. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. that's right. Okay. It was the data whether or not the student that's exactly right. So the, it, with the drop-down system that we had in our LMS, faculty would go and say, so you have kind of students were the rows, and the columns were the SLOs that were being assessed, and they it was just a simple drop-down menu in the LMS, and you would go in and, you know, Matthew DeSantis, SLO1, and the drop-down was going to be not proficient, minimally proficient, proficient, highly proficient, and then uh, we also, we, we uh, essentially no-shows, uh, students who just didn't show by a 10% point, so we, we could quantify that as well. Uh, and so we, that's how we broke it out, and then, yeah, aggregating that information. So, it's interesting though, that's what you guys looked at, because that's one of the things we learned was a problem. Uh, <laughs> um, so, one of the lessons learned was have a gimmick and have awards. Um, I was telling you about Don, the welder, uh, who was my coach here. When it came time to actually present in front of everybody, Don was extraordinarily nervous. And he said, I have to do something to get all this nervous energy out of me. I said, okay, whatever. <laughs> and I said, you know, because he was going to lead us off, and then I was going to kind of close up the presentation. And so he got out there, and he did a cartwheel in front of all the faculty, <laughs> and, and, and it was a great cart, it was the best cart I've ever seen. Uh, it was far better than any sort of machination I can do. And so he did this cartwheel. Well, the faculty thought this was the funniest damn thing that they'd ever seen. And so the next semester, Don welded a little stick figure doing a cartwheel, and we gave out assessment cartwheel awards to the best faculty, you know, the best departments on campus who have been Holy doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so you'd think that we were giving out Oscars. I mean, the faculty loved this. They were so proud of their assessment cartwheel award that Don had welded and put on a block of wood. And, you know, but this was a big deal for them. And so they thought it was great, and they loved the fact that the students helped weld it, and, and you know, that was a cool thing. Uh, and they liked getting that recognition. And then every semester we had to keep doing something, and so suddenly we had dueling cartwheels, I was doing cartwheels, <laughs> I have a background in professional wrestling, that's a whole other story we'll talk about later. I, I was not the wrestler, <laughs> I was just a ring announcer. Um, but next thing you know, I'm wearing a Lucha Libre mask, and we're doing we're doing uh, we're doing leg kicks off of uh, you know the cartwheels. It was it was something else. But we just put on a production basically, and it reminded me of my very first semester teaching uh, in graduate school. 
When I went to a friend of mine who was a year ahead of me, I went to him for all of his wisdom, <laughs> you know, his two classes that he had taught in his career. And I said, Steve, what's the key to being a good teacher? He says, one third babysitter, one third stand up comedian, and one third educator. Uh, and, and, and he's not that far off, I, I realized. <laughs> and, but it was, it was about entertainment, and it was about you know, comedy, and it was about just keeping things loose. And that was the other part, it was loose. People started looking forward to our presentations of what silly things are Matthew and Don gonna do and that sort of stuff. So it, it was a neat, like I said, it was a gimmick, but it was a neat gimmick to do. Uh, it was something to just kind of loosen up the overall atmosphere. Uh, facilitators in the breakout sessions, I would prefer, looking back, if they were all faculty. Uh, really, no senior administration, deans in some cases, but really all faculty. Uh, I think it just takes, provides different energy in the room uh, and provides maybe a little less concern of people looking over shoulders and things like that. And so I, I would really push towards just faculty being facilitators. Assessment data was too much to digest initially. The faculty showed up and here's all this assessment data. It was a little too much, it was a little overwhelming. Um, so what we started to do was I would start emailing the assessment data to the department chair and to the assessment contacts a few days before the assessment day activity. So they would have a couple of days to digest, to disseminate it to the rest of the department. So, and, and it was still there in the classroom when they showed up, but they had at least seen it ahead of time. They had been able to digest it a little bit, think about it a little bit more, and they weren't just kind of confronted with this data out of nowhere uh, and kind of asked to do things. Also, we pushed back when plans and reports were due. Rather than being due at the end of the session, we said two weeks after the end of the session they had to be submitted. It allowed two things. One, it allowed for more thoughtful interactions to take place, more thoughtful uh, you know, continuous improvement. It also allowed a good excuse for me, two weeks later, to come back to everybody and go, hey, remember what we talked about with assessment? Because what we discovered was people were creating assessment plans and assessment reports in and, and that one day, and then kind of going, Job done, did it, you know, submitted. And that was not what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that this was a little bit more of a continuous process and that there was uh, that additional follow-up. So we implemented some changes there. These were voluntary plans and reports? No, they were mandatory reports that had to be turned in. Uh, and I would just continually hound people until they, <laughs> until they turned How them in. How was the turn on at the end? Uh, what's that? The turn on, the submission turn on. Uh, very good. Uh, very, very, very few. I'm trying to think. Initially, there was a couple, but really by the end, we had about 100% uh, completion. Uh, so, and, and this is what also helped was I was kind of the heavy for arts and sciences and kind of allied health and business, and Don was the heavy for the kind of career technical areas. And so we could kind of divide out work and leverage personal relationships and, and kind of we could get people to submit something, and it might not have always been perfect, but something could have gotten submitted, and, and we can kind of leverage those relationships. So 100% completion from both full-time and adjunct? Full-time, only full-time here, only full-time apart. Yeah, good distinction though, very important distinction. So lessons learned from uh, Florida Southern and St. Edwards. One, don't force assessment day, it doesn't have to fit. Uh, both at the Florida Southern and St. Edwards had built-in professional development uh, events for faculty uh, that reached a significant audience. They were not eager to do an assessment day activity as a standalone. Uh, and so what I've done is partnered with the Career uh, Center for Teaching Excellence, I should say, uh, so working with the CTE at both of those schools to make sure that assessment is a part of what they're doing and a part of a larger uh, implementation, part of a larger uh, event. Uh, and then use the venues and events that are already in place as a proxy for assessment day. Like I said, don't force it. Uh, not every institution is ready for it. Not every institution has the bandwidth. Not every institution has the infrastructure. And that's okay. That's I mean, assessment days do not solve all of your problems. There are plenty of schools that have assessment day that are really not doing well on assessment. Okay? So it's, it's not a, a problem solver. It's just a way to get people engaged. And if there's another way to get people engaged outside of that, go for it. So just to give you a sense of what we were doing at Florida Southern, Florida Southern had a half-day professional development event for faculty at the beginning of each term. Um, they had, as I say here, two concurrent sessions with five presentations in each. Sessions could have been about how to get, uh, how to do grants, 
that a lot of STEM faculty who are interested in doing grants. Great. So one session's about grants, another session's about building out an online course, another session's about uh, you know, using technology in the classroom, and then I would have a session about assessment. And I would get 25 to 35 faculty members, and every semester I'd kind of give a little bit of a different presentation about assessment. So even if it was the same 25 or 35 people who kept coming to my session, at least they were getting something different every time around. And a lot of times, they, it wasn't the same 25 or 35. Uh, and so it was a new group. And it was, listen, I didn't get to everybody, but I got to a sizable chunk. You know, you're talking about 140 full-time faculty. Over a period of three, four semesters, I, I got to almost everyone. Uh, and so it wasn't the same sort of breakout session, developing reports, it wasn't that but it was at least letting faculty know this is what assessment is, this is what the process is gonna look like, here's, here's some ideas, here are best practices, here's other ideas, here's ways to engage. Um, Florida Southern also had professional development initiatives. Uh, these were really neat activities. Usually there were six or seven throughout the course of the semester uh, that people, a lot of times it was staff who would provide the professional development initiative. Sometimes it was on advising, sometimes it was on online education, mine obviously were on assessment. And it was a set, basically a mini course. So it was four 90 minute courses. And faculty received a $250 stipend for completing all four workshops of a particular session. Uh, and so I put together an assessment course. I think I had maybe 10, 12 people complete the first semester I did it. I had about 15 complete the second semester I did it. And that doesn't seem like a ton, but in those four workshops, I help people get from kind of the basics to a pretty advanced level of understanding assessment. And I knew that by the end, I had helped develop 10 assessment leaders, 15 assessment leaders. And that can make a huge difference on a campus with 140 faculty. If you have 25 people who are now assessment leaders spread across all the departments, that's making some significant progress. So I used what was there. In terms of the, when the rubber meets the road, getting reports done, getting things submitted, getting data to faculty, that was where my day-to-day -day job was working with people one-on-one, -on -one, setting up individual meetings, you know, scheduling follow-up meetings, et cetera. But there wasn't the opportunity or platform for an overall day for that. So you use what was there, you use what was given. Who funded the $250? Provost's office. Office of the Provost would fund it. And it was pretty well, um, faculty was pretty well attended. Uh, overall, I would say usually uh, 50 to 60 faculty per semester were completed. Uh, so, I mean, it did add up a little bit, but that was something the provost had had similar structure at his previous institution when he came to Florida Southern and or something. And assessment was just one of the options. Right? Absolutely, yeah, just one. There were usually six or seven variety of topics. Uh, one was about NSF grants, another was about uh, advising modules and how to better advise students because they had a faculty-centered advising model, so things like that. So at St. Edwards University, their Center for Teaching Excellence holds an annual day-long professional development event, very similar to what Florida Southern does. It's on a variety of different topics, concurrent sessions, that sort of thing. Uh, and so I'm presenting this coming fall. This is going to be my first opportunity to do that, but it's a great opportunity for we're developing a brand new general education curriculum that is being implemented this coming this coming fall. So it's a great opportunity to get in front of everybody to talk about that. Yep. So when professional development was uh, planned for the year, mm -hmm. it was just kind of the best approach is kind of implementing throughout professional development activities, especially the main ones that are kind of like like we have here, like mm -hmm. our first one of the semesters kind of required, like making that a part of it, right? Yeah. Is that how Absolutely. And then yeah. Planning activities throughout the year that are part of the professional development plan. Absolutely. And, and also with these kind of day-long events or half-day events, there's also an application process. So I would apply to present at this at the beginning of the semester. Uh, and so there were several competing ideas. I mean, a lot of times everybody who wants to present gets to present. Um, but uh, there, is a little, there is a more formal application process, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so this is just the first time, kind of at the beginning of the year, you get as many people as possible, and then yeah, there's those individual breakouts throughout the rest of the semester. Um, and so this is a great opportunity to kind of engage the topic of the new general education curriculum, as well as introduce the new unit, because uh, at St. Edwards, this institutional effectiveness and planning unit is brand new, it just 
was, was really created back in December. So a lot of faculty have heard of it, but they don't really know anything about it. Yet, they know about assessment, but they don't know about the kind of nuts and bolts in the larger team. So it's a good way of introducing us to faculty. Um, Center for Teaching Excellence also provides semester-long innovation fellowships to faculty. Faculty who want to innovate their class, they want to change their class. Uh, it's focused around developing signature assignments, the AACNU uh, signature assignment kind of philosophy. And so they are kind of, just like I said, semester-long activity. And the CET, a CTE director has developed one session that's just devoted to assessment. And that's when I come in and kind of talk about assessment of signature assignments in the classroom, what that might look like, et cetera. So uh, once again, working with the mechanisms and institutions that are already in place to develop something that really works. Okay, so how do we keep this momentum going uh, as it relates to assessment? One is college administration needs to commit to assessment uh, becoming a part of every single meeting. That was one thing I couldn't thank at Guilford Tech. I could not thank our president or vice president enough. Uh, every single meeting, something was said about assessment. Even if assessment was not being presented, it was mentioned. And it was just reinforced. This is important. This is something, and it wasn't, and it wasn't reinforced as this is something you're going to have to do. It was, this is something we're gonna continue to talk about. This is something that's still important. And the most important time that happened was right after we got through reaffirmation. We got through reaffirmation and everybody thought, huh, we got through it. We didn't get any red flags. We didn't get any citations. We're okay. And everybody thought, oh, we can let our guard down for a while. And that was the most important time for the administration to say, assessment's gonna be ongoing. It's not gonna stop. We're committed to this, okay? This is not another one of these initiatives that goes away after a couple of years. This is a constant process. Uh, and so they adopted some very, I think, gentle language. Uh, it was not harsh, it was not top down, but it was a way of constantly reminding faculty that assessment was going to be a big part of the semester. Assessment leaders should meet with departments at least once per semester. Um, I would, I can make a point to see depart at least department chairs twice a semester and preferably meeting with the entire department once per semester. Uh, just to get my face in front of them, if nothing else. Uh, and just to kind of give a five minute, hey, this is what we're doing this semester, these are the critical dates, what do you need from me? Even if it's just something that short and informal, but just to make sure it's a constant presence so that people aren't blindsided by assessment. Did you also address um, student services part of assessment? I did, yeah, so I would meet with uh, travel abroad. Uh, at St. Edwards I do a lot of this, and at Florida Southern I did a lot of this too. At Guilford Tech I was just on academic. Uh, and so, but at Florida Southern and St. Edwards, yes, uh, meeting with our study abroad office, our advising office, uh, the Student Success Center, you know, uh, uh, academic support services, meeting with all of those areas as well. Uh, a lot of times, they were a little, in my experience, they were a little further ahead in assessment than some of the academic areas, just because a lot of times they were used to uh, justifying their budget through assessment or through evaluation of how effective they were. And so they already had mechanisms in place in a lot of cases. So they were a little bit more advanced in, in my experience, uh, but I still made a point to go and meet with them at least once a semester, uh, just to say, hey, and to say, this is where I am and let me know if you need help. And if you want to develop a new uh, assessment tool, let me know. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, departments and schools should have an assessment report built into every meeting. Uh, with a designated faculty member reporting out. When I say assessment report here, I just mean like an assessment update. Uh, so just, you know, to have one person in the department who's responsible for every meeting just going, hey, this is where we're at with assessment and uh, everything's on track and I've communicated with the adjunct faculty about this or, you know, this is the plan that we're, this is the SLO we're assessing this semester, etc. cetera. So uh, that's where, like I said, the um, assessment contact model at GTCC really helped. So every single department had an assessment contact. And it was never the department chair. Because the department chairs already had too much responsibility. So we didn't want this to be one more thing the department chair had to do. And so we said, somebody in the department, what initially was whoever drew the short straw, but somebody in the department should be the assessment contact, preferably a junior faculty member, because it was a great opportunity for college service and great opportunity to, to engage in leadership. And so 
they would be the assessment contact and they would be the person that I would interact with most closely outside of the department chair. Uh, and so I would work with them a lot. I would give them a lot of resources. I would make sure that they got to where they needed to be in terms of being an assessment leader. Um, and that was a really, really effective model. It worked at Guilford Tech because we had such large departments. At Florida Southern, at St. Edwards, we have a lot of one or two person departments. So an assessment contact becomes kind of nonsensical in a lot of ways. Um, I was a one person department in political science. I was you know, my own assessment contact. So it, it kind of, like I said, loses some of the uh, impact at a smaller institution. Uh, development and investigation. Offer professional development opportunities for faculty on assessment throughout the semester. Shouldn't be a one-time event, shouldn't be a one-off. It should be something that is constant. Uh, it should be something that there should always be an opportunity for professional development. And I held a lot of professional development events on assessment over the last five or six years. And I have to tell you, there have been times that one faculty member showed up. And that's okay. Because I'm going to talk to that one faculty member and tell them blue in the face about assessment. And we're going to have a conversation about assessment. And they're going to leave that session knowing a lot about assessment. And that's, and that's one more person I got. Okay? And that's the way you just have to frame it. So even when the sessions and the more and more sessions you offer, you go, geez, we're just not getting a lot of people. That's okay. Uh, because slowly but surely, you're making that momentum. You're making that um, uh, impact. Like I said earlier, the English and psychology departments would buy lunch to get more adjunct faculty participation into this, and I would go to them during their department meetings, and that's when I would give professional development opportunities or, or little kind of mini presentations or mini workshops or something like that, because um, I would meet them on their terms rather than saying this is when I'm doing it. You know, we're doing it Friday from 11, you know, to 12, and that's it. I would go and meet them, uh, and so and I would do that with other departments too, not just the larger ones. Uh, and then incorporate institutional research. This was something that was really interesting, um, was getting faculty focused on big questions, particularly at a community college. There was a lot of questions about how developmental education had an impact on the proficiency of student learning outcomes. Students who came through developmental education versus students who tested straight into the class without developmental. Uh, and so there was a lot of fallacies on our campus around that. There was a lot of faculty think this is what's happening. Administrators think this is what's happening. But using the data that was out there to actually demonstrate this is what's happening. So I'll just share with you one particular story to illustrate this. I had a faculty member in business administration, HR management, who was really despondent over her student proficiency of SLOs, or SLO proficiency of our students. And she said, oh, it's gotta be because there's no developmental prereq on my course. I said, okay. Well, you know something? Institutional research can solve this problem. And so I went to our one person in IR at the time, and I said, hey, you don't have enough to do. Uh, let me give you another little project. And I, I, I talked to him, and what he did was very simple. I said, I want to know students who have had zero or one level of developmental education who have taken this course and, how, and match up how they did on the SLOs versus students who've completed developmental education or test out. Came back, zero correlation between dev ed and completion of dev ed and the proficiency of SLOs. Made the faculty member totally reconfigure how they thought about the continuous improvement plan. Because they thought, oh, well, I'm just going to embed dev English or dev math elements into this class, and that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's not the problem, it turns out. Problem is much more systemic, and so it made her reevaluate the way she taught the course in terms of content, and and really kind of reevaluated that. So sometimes, like I said, bringing in institutional research can get to some of those questions um, that faculty might have, or or misperceptions that we all sometimes have in higher education. So continuing the discussion at Guilford Tech, uh, like I said, assessment leaders attended all department meetings within their division. So we had uh, about a 15 person assessment committee and each, we had two representatives from every division and one of those two representatives went to the department meetings within their division whenever they occur. Uh, some departments met bi-weekly, some departments met once a semester. Uh, so it varied, uh, but that was something that there was, we made sure that there was always a voice or a set of ears in every department meeting that was taking place. And that wasn't to spy on people or things like that, it was really 
to gauge the temperature of the faculty and to say what are people talking about, what are they frustrated with, what do they like, what do they not like, and then kind of coming back and thinking through that as a group. Um, I would always provide feedback to any assessment report that was provided, uh, submitted. First, to just demonstrate that it was being reviewed. I couldn't tell when I started at Florida Southern, that was, I, I was getting thanked by department chairs. Thank you for sending us feedback. We've been sending these reports to IR for years and never hearing anything back about it. So just letting them know, I actually looked at this, and it looks good. Or I looked at this, and eh, there's some issues. But I looked at it, and I'm providing you feedback, and I'm providing you some ideas. Um, and so, like I said, also pushing back on certain concepts with regards to continuous improvement. I had a, a department at Florida Southern that had this huge idea about revamping their entire curriculum. And I said, whoa, this is a really ambitious continuous improvement plan that could take about five years to implement. Why don't we think this through in smaller chunks and then you know, maybe try to tackle it that way? Uh, but it, it was a way of just thinking through that because what ultimately happens when you have too ambitious of a plan is nobody ends up following through with it and then nothing gets done. That's uh, just a thing. Um, and then I would, like I said, create sp uh, presentations specific to divisions or departments, programs that have third party accreditations, business schools with AAC, BS, AACSB accreditation, education programs reporting out to DOE. Uh, any programs, a lot of allied health programs that had third party accreditation, I would create kind of specific presentations or opportunities for them. Programs with high adjunct population work with them about their issues that they were dealing with and, and different solutions that they might have. Uh, and then programs with several different instructors teaching the same course, uh, where there was a concern that assessment was going to standardize the class, that everybody was going to have to teach the same thing and give the same assignment, and it was going to be, everybody was just going to be a robot and kind of working with them to say that's not how it has to be. Let's develop a rubric that can be applied no matter what type of assignment you provide. And so that was a big part of it. When you demonstrated yeah. that you had reviewed their, their reports, mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about how, um, how that unfolded. Yeah. Sure, so it was a lot of times it was by email. Uh, compliance assist didn't have a great mechanism by which to, like, they, they did, but it wouldn't, uh, so I could type a review into the compliance assist report, but it wouldn't email the person who had done the report so to let them know. So you reading all the reports that were coming in? Mm -hmm. So I would just read the reports coming in, uh, and <laughs> that was the fun of my day. And so, yeah, just reading the reports coming in, and then just writing back, you know, and just shooting an email back to the department chair or the faculty member who did the report, and say, you know, this is, um, this looks good. I mean, sometimes it was very brief. I mean, a lot of times, by the time assessment really got going, a lot of times they were very self-sufficient. So a lot of times it was, hey, this looks great. Think about doing this maybe in the future, or this might be an issue. Can we meet and talk about this in more detail? Something like that. So it wasn't a lengthy review, but at least let them know I was looking at it, that I was engaging them, and that it wasn't just going into a black box somewhere. Yeah, question in the back. Was there a time frame on this review, or was that an ongoing conversation? It was an ongoing conversation. It was, I mean, they would have to submit reports annually, uh, and so I would try to review them within a month of their, uh, I would try to get through everybody within a month uh, of their review, uh, and engage them that subsequent semester after it was being uh, implemented. Uh, but there was no exact timetable, uh, and some departments I also, after I was at Florida Southern for a while, some departments were very, very, very self-sufficient on this and had a really great structure. And I knew they were good. And I would kind of talk to the department chair or something like that and say, I looked at everything, you guys are fine. And I would kind of devote my resources to those areas that really needed it a little bit more. When you say assessment report, you're referring to course level report or program level report? So Florida Southern program level at Guilford Tech course level. So I've done kind of both ways uh, in the past. Yeah. And the course level, she pointed out, there would be one report for the entire English 111. Okay. So it wasn't instructor by instructor English 111. It was English 111 report. Here it is. That sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not looking through 330 reports. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm not Superman, that's for sure. I, yeah. I have, I have three dogs, two cats. I got a wife. I, I don't have so yeah. How these reviews? Yeah. Did you? How many? I'm just wondering how detailed did you prompt them with questions? Or were they like bursting with information that they wanted to share? Uh, I would. Some departments were. It, it varied. 
to answer your question uh, succinctly, it varied. Some departments were extremely thorough with their continuous improvement plans, with the analysis of their data, et cetera. It was great, and I didn't have to do a lot of prompting, and it was a lot of just good job, you know, or hey, maybe this one thing might be an idea in the future, that sort of thing. Other departments, and it ended up being a lot of times in my career technical areas in, at Guilford Tech, they were just very, one sentence. <laughs> Their continuous improvement plan was two sentences. And I'd be like, okay guys, like let's think through this a little bit more. And so there, it was a lot of prompting, and it was a lot of questions. And a lot of times there, there was so much that I could write that a lot of times I would just say, hey, let's meet rather than me trying to write out an entire response and saying, hey, I looked at your assessment report, I have a couple of notes, let's, try, let's find a time to meet and talk about this in person. And that was a lot of times more advantageous than just going back and forth on email and just kind of saying, here's some other questions you should consider and then resubmitting something that's four sentences instead of two sentences. So uh, it, was, it was a process. So continuing the conversation at Florida Southern and St. Edwards, uh, providing feedback about assessment plans and reports are done via email to department chairs. There we're just focused on program level uh, assessment, so it's not as course specific. So really it's just going to department chairs or program coordinators. Uh, but it's still an email process similar to this. Some departments still very short, very succinct, and sometimes it's let's meet, let's chat about this. Um, send out periodic email communication with all faculty about assessment. Uh, engaged faculty over debate over the value of assessment. The New York Times op-ed from a couple of months ago from a professor at the University of North Carolina, which I couldn't help but see the irony of a school that just got caught in an academic fraud scandal complaining about assessment. Of course. Um, if assessment had been in place, there would be no academic fraud scandal, but that's beside the point. Uh, and so, you know, <laughs> and just having come from North Carolina previously, it was just like, oh, very frustrating. And, um, but I would engage faculty in that. We have, uh, at St. Edwards, we have something, uh, Facebook Workplace. It's not as great as you think. Uh, and it, it's, it's Facebook, but it's not really Facebook, and it's, people post stuff up there. But it's a great way to engage, and so I posted the op-ed. And then I posted the inside, you know, uh, higher education response. Uh, and so it was, but it was, it was great, it spurred discussion and it got faculty talking about it. Some faculty agreed, some faculty, a lot of faculty disagreed, but still, it was good to have that discussion and say, hey, this is the national dialogue. This is what's being talked about out there. Um, but it, and they it, were willing to chime in and work on Facebook? At, well, on Facebook Workplace, yes. So, but yes, they were. Uh, they've done a great job implementing it and rolling it out, and faculty were, you know, I was getting notifications about comments all the time, and yeah, it was, it was just really, very thoughtful discussion about assessment. So it was very cool. Um, the other thing I did, which was also engaged faculty, which is not nearly as academically or high-minded, was I created a rubric to pick teams during the NCAA tournament. Uh, and so, because I love sports and I like winning. And so, uh, and so I created this rubric and I thought about it literally two days before the tournament started. So it was very slapdash uh, and put together. But I, you know, I had overall experience, level of NBA talent, coaching experience, point guard experience, blah, 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 and all these categories, and all uh, definitions of what each category meant, what it meant to be a two for coaching experience versus a four, et cetera. And so I put this whole uh, uh, rubric together and I sent it out to the faculty. I said, have fun. I said, if you want to use it, go for it. And so I used it. And it, it took a little time on the front end, but I, every single team had a point value in the rubric. And then it was just very simple about which team had the highest point value in that particular matchup. And so I just followed the point value. Filled out my bracket on ESPN Tournament Challenge, finished in the 97th percentile, <laughs> thank you very much, and picked Villanova to win the national championship. So I was thrilled. There you go. Also, it, it may have also helped that I came from outside of Philadelphia and liked Villanova going in. Uh, so that might have impacted my decision on the rubric a little bit. Uh, so, but it was, it's a fun way to engage them about assessment in a non-academic way. You go, hey, here's this kind of goofy way to think about using rubrics, and it's, it's fun. Um, as I said before, the CT provides a, a nice platform to engage faculty consistently throughout the semester on assessment, through presentations, through workshops. Um, the only downside of Florida Southern and St. Edwards 
is, and I don't know if it's a downside, but the, the biggest difference there between Guilford Tech was there's a lot of conflicting schedules, and a lot of these assessment meetings do have to be one-on-ones or very small group meetings. So it is a lot of me just going and talking to two people or three people, and that's okay. Uh, and it's a much more collaborative environment, but it just eats up a lot more time, and it's a, a very time-consuming. Borrow from assessment leaders. That's another big thing. Um, there's a lot of stealing that goes on in assessment, good stealing uh, that goes on in assessment. So steal <laughs> frequently. The University of Kentucky has an assessment listserv that has years and years and years of worth of threads and discussions and debates. Um, but also their website, their assessment website is tremendous. Uh, great resources up there. Uh, and so it shows that a research institution can do really meaningful assessment. Uh, they have 47 full-time assessment institutional research staff uh, at the University of Kentucky. Oh, oh, oh. It is stunning. <laughs> I know. I interviewed there like four years ago, and, and I was like, oh, I got this, you know, interview for this assessment job, drove up to Lexington, saw the horses, everything was great. And uh, <laughs> I like horse racing. So, um, and I interviewed, and I remember I was interviewing, and they said, now you would just be the assistant director of assessment for Student support services. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. I'm coming from a, I, not, I wasn't complaining at the time, but it was, I was just doing assessment for a 15,000 student institution for all 86 academic programs, and now you're telling me there's a position here that just does assessment for the Student Success Center. It's amazing. <laughs> so uh, they have an incredible amount of resources there, and it's, it's awesome. Um, but they also built out those resources online. They have a great website. I encourage you to check it out. Valencia College in Orlando, Florida uh, won the uh, initial Aspen Award for the best community college in the country. Uh, their president, Sandy Sugar, if you've never heard him speak, do yourself a favor, uh, find a speech. Probably the most dynamic person, the dynamic leader in higher education I've ever seen. Uh, and Valencia has done a great job of demonstrating how a state in a how a community college in a state that has very dysfunctional funding and politics right now, uh, to say the least. Uh, and I went to grad school in Florida, and I worked in Florida, so I've been there for seven years. So I, uh, you know, it, it is dysfunctional. And um, yeah, and it's, it's Florida. I mean, it just it is just is. There's a reason that every crazy story you see in the news, some Florida man got bit by an alligator. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so, um, but Valencia is outstanding in what they do, and they went through a process. I know uh, Dr. Zuger instituted something when he got there. They were probably having problems just collecting assessment data. And so what they did was they, the week after finals, he paid all full-time faculty a stipend, provided breakfast and lunch every day for an entire week, had a huge thousand-person conference room, had breakout tables and everything, and essentially held AP-style assessment for the entire institution. And this was the time, it was assessment week. And it was, we're gonna assess our student artifacts, and we're gonna do it as a group, and we're gonna talk about it afterwards, and we're gonna have, the, it was this amazing collaborative experience. But it takes a will in senior leadership, and it takes a lot of funding, and it takes a space as well. That's the part you don't sometimes think about, it's just the logistics of it, to pull that type of an event off. Um, but it is, <clears throat> I mean, what, what they've done on assessment is really tremendous. Uh, and then James Madison University, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, they have uh, the only doctoral program in assessment studies in the country. Uh, they have uh, faculty who teach assessment, uh, and their approach is a little bit more academic. Uh, so it's a little bit more about peer-reviewed journal articles, and it's a little bit more about studies and research and assessment rather than this is how you create a rubric, this is how you, uh, you know, uh, these are good assessment tools, these are good uh, signature assignments, etc. cetera. Uh, and they highlight their own faculty strengths. Uh, as well. So these are just links to the assessment web pages at each of those institutions. So when you get a chance to look through those slides, uh, check out those as potential resources. So finally, continuous improvement. We're, we're getting towards the end. Uh, so finally, continuous improvement, the language of continuous improvement. Notice how the entire time I did not say the term closing the loop. I despise that term. Uh, I despise it because it has become one of those terms in higher education that has taken on a meaning beyond what it initially meant to be. And it became a term that when people hear it, they go, here we go again, administrator talk. You know, it just, it, you know, it's the same thing when I hear people say silos. Oh, it's 
So it's, it's, it's the new, you know, newest and greatest term uh, in higher ed. And so closing the loop has kind of taken on that language. It also gives a sense of a definitive conclusion to something. We've closed the loop. We're done. We're not done. Uh, I never thought of assessment as a loop. I thought about it more as, and this is an analogy that's not, or a metaphor that's not going to work much longer with our current generation, but a telephone landline port. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a progress. That, yeah, there are loops, but you're always moving forward to something else. It's a cycle. It's not, it's not just done, done, done. It's not that. It's, it's much more cyclical, much more forward moving. And so some of the terms, I use the term continuous improvement. That's the term that we use at St. Edward's. That's the term that I used at uh, Florida Southern. But some people don't like the word improvement there. Some people say, listen, I have 95% of my students who are proficient. What can I possibly improve? I get that. So I've seen people use the term continuous refinement, continuous enhancement. Everything can be refined. Everything can be enhanced a little bit. Enhancement plan. Language is important, I think. Uh, I'd spent a lot of time talking about it when I would teach political science, I teach speech and rhetoric and politics. Words are important. And closing the loop is one of those words that can just have a loaded meaning and that when people hear, they just start tuning out. And uh, it just becomes higher ed talk. And so reframing that action in different language, I think can be very helpful. Uh, and so creating some visuals or forms that faculty can easily decipher and appreciate. I know I said I don't like loops, but this is a very simple one <laughs> to kind of throw up there. Also, um, I need to talk to Microsoft Word or, or Microsoft Suite to develop better smart art, to you know, really develop something that's more cyclical. Um, but, uh, you know, the traditional visuals of assessment, uh, certainly something that's simple for faculty to understand. You create and modify an assessment plan, you assess the scheduled outcomes, you collect the assessment data, you analyze it, you develop a continuous improvement plan. You just you do it over again, and it never stops. But it's it, you know breaking it down so that it's simple to follow, that it's five steps, and that it's not this complex process is important. Um, my former vice president of instruction at Guilford Tech actually used this loop to talk to faculty about assessment, which I thought was really interesting. She really tied assessment into a much larger loop of funding and of academic program review and institutional effectiveness and of the budget. And to say, this is, yes, you have this assessment loop, but understand that's part of this much larger loop that's going on. And so do you want more resources for your department? Well, this is a good way to justify it. Do you have needs that, need, you know, that have to be met? If so, this is a way to justify it. This is a way to talk about academic program review. This is a way to talk about curriculum planning and curriculum review. And this is a way to justify information for the budget and to justify new purchases or new hires, or new innovation, or a larger professional development fund, whatever the case might be. So it was a way of putting the assessment loop in the larger loop of higher education. I thought this was very important because uh, I, I remember as a faculty member, I served as a faculty representative on the strategic plan at Guilford Tech. And I never felt so small in my life. <laughs> as a faculty member on a day-to-day -day basis, I think I'm the center of an institution. Because why would I think otherwise? Everybody at the institutions, they're taking classes. I'm teaching them. Great. <laughs> right? But then I got into strategic planning, and I realized, oh, there's Honda Jet. And, and there's Boeing. And there's, you know, there are these representatives from, you know, major industry. And they're sending their people there to get trained. And they're, and they're having these business relationships. And then the, the, all the chancellors of the four-year schools were there in the area. And then all the principals and superintendents of the county schools were there. And I realized, my gosh, as a faculty member, I'm just a small part of this much larger institution that's going on. And I think this loop kind of gets at that a little bit. To say what you're doing is right here. But understand that's feeding into this much larger process that's taking place. Assessment day forms. One of the things I mentioned uh, earlier was that we adapted our compliance assist form into a worksheet. Why? Well, first, not a lot of faculty at assessment day had their laptops. So it was going to be a limited number of people who could actually get online and type anything in. Second, when you type something in to a form and click save or submit, it feels very final. 
And it doesn't always feel very collaborative either, because one person's at the laptop typing everything down. So we created forms uh, and just you know worksheets for people to fill out. And it was a little bit more collaborative for faculty to do that. Uh, they could cross things out when they, thought, when they realized it was a bad idea. They could add things to it. They could go back and type it and polish it up later. But it was a way to get faculty to um, be a little bit more engaged in the process rather than just dictating to one person behind a computer and type it into a, a, a report. Um, on the worksheet, provide examples, provide do's and don'ts to ensure what you get is what you want. Uh, don't just provide a blank template. Just don't say, all right, here's a blank worksheet and then expect it to miraculously come back completed the exact way you want. Uh, and so with ours, this was an example of what I, uh, this was an example that we would provide to each department or each table for the breakout session was to say, you know, continuous improvement plan. What did you learn through the process? What have you uh, done to, I apologize for the, or how have you uh, improved uh, student learning? What might you do differently in the future? What changes uh, have you made as a result of this process? Okay, and then kind of filled in very kind of generic response, but a response that indicates this is kind of where we're going with what we want back. Uh, and so giving them some direction uh, and letting them complete some of this outside of the software interface. Uh, another form that we created was just very simple, straight across. It was, uh, and it was two clunky to do a screenshot and put it in here. So I just kind of created, a, recreated the form uh, in a table. But it was basically, you know, list your SLO, list your classes that you're assessing, list your achievement target, what tool did you use to assess the SLO, what were your assessment findings and results, what's your continuous improvement plan? Kind of all one table, once again, something they could work out, something they could write on, uh, and then something that, if worse came to worst, I could at the very least transcribe back into compliance assessment. If the faculty just you know didn't get around to doing it or something like that, I could provide that support. And defining the final step, so providing examples of what continuous improvement looks like, I think there's a lot of misperceptions about that, um, and kind of talking a little bit about the different methods you can use to quote unquote close the loop or develop a continuous improvement. So just to go through a couple of examples, and these are all real examples that I've dealt with uh, at all the, well, Florida Southern and at um, Guilford Tech. Guilford Tech, the welding program discovered there was a correlation between attendance and SLO proficiency. Not shocking. More you're in class, the more likely you are to understand the outcome. They created a mandatory attendance policy, but attendance was still an issue. They surveyed the students and found transportation at campus was a major impediment. What was their closing loop? They developed a ride-sharing program with fellow students and faculty. That was their closing loop. Was that? It didn't have anything to do with teaching a classroom. They knew once they got them in the classroom, they were going to learn. That was it. Was getting them in the classroom that was the problem. And so that was their that was their process. Um, and not surprisingly, SLO proficiency increased sixty-five percent the following semester. Sure, get them in the class more regularly. They're going to be better better welders. I would hope so. Uh, and so that's an example of nothing educational, nothing classroom driven is the closing loop. I think that's the misperception a lot of times. I have to do something to change my course to close the loop. Nope, not at all. Closing the loop can be something much more basic than that. Chemistry department, Florida Southern College uh, had wonderful research. They were a great research department. Uh, students had tremendous research opportunities. Uh, but uh, their SLO proficiency on content was a little lacking. So a lot of their lab-based SLOs were really, really strong, but their course-based SLOs were really lagging behind. Um, so what did they do? They sent two faculty members to a STEM conference on pedagogy, and then those two faculty members came back and provided multiple workshops to the rest of the department. What did they end up doing? They ended up implementing several AAC and U high impact practices, developed learning communities, uh, developed all sorts of signature assignments in their classrooms, and saw an immediate increase in proficiency of content-based SLOs among the first year cohort. And so this was an opportunity, and closing the loop, I, I, in continuous improvement, I tell faculty this all the time. It's an opportunity to justify professional development. It's an opportunity to go to conferences. It's an opportunity for you to say, here's the impediment that we're facing, here's the barrier, here's what we need to do 
to achieve it. History department, uh, this was at Florida Southern, was displeased with the student proficiency of oral communication outcomes. They had to, you know, communicate well orally and in writing, uh, but it was, it was split out in two different SLOs. The students would get to their senior seminar, give a 40 minute presentation, everybody would complain how terrible it was. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> the question, had you taught them teaching, had you taught them speaking before that? No, okay, that might be the problem. <laughs> um, and so what did they do? Well, they worked with the communication department. They had resources on campus already. They had experts on communication. So they worked with the communication department to develop a series of lesson plans and embedded communication strategies into their history content. They focused more about communication of historical figures. They showed communication strategies of historical figures. They got students to do, uh, uh, they started doing simulations, uh, historical simulations. So, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a lot of fun. And it got students more comfortable speaking, and not so surprisingly, within two years, they saw a 100% uh, increase in the number of students who were deemed highly proficient in oral communication. Okay? Went from being terrible to being really, the students always had the ability, it was just, it was never being activated, it was never being reinforced, or let alone mastered. This is the Guilford Tech Automotive Department was displeased about student proficiency and customer service and oral communication outcomes. That was a big part of their program outcome, was good customer service. Um, when I worked with the faculty, I said, so where do you teach them customer service? We, they learn it first day, first semester. Right? Do they learn it any other time? Oh, well, no. <laughs> they learn it first day, first semester. <laughs> and then we're shocked six semesters later when they finish, they have, they're not really good at it. Um, and so what they did is they reevaluated the curriculum. And they said, wow, we have to embed this into more of our courses. We have to make customer service a bigger part of what we're doing, course to course to course. Uh, and so they restructured it. Within two years, we started finally see people matriculate through, 60% increase in proficiency of learning outcome. Um, these are not life-shattering changes that people are making, but they make a difference in student proficiency. This was my own example. Uh, when I taught political science to go for tech. I discovered that due to a lack of prerequisites, I didn't have uh, English 111 as a prereq on my American government class, so students could just show up and take American government uh, without ever having taken a college English course, which was really fun for research, and, uh, and particularly some of the sources that I got back for my papers. Um, and so, but achieved minimal proficiency on writing and research-based SLOs. Had a lot of issues with that. This is at the course level. Um, so I worked with the English department to develop consistent lesson plans that would introduce the same ideas they would later reinforce when they were enrolled in English composition. One of the things I would do in political, because I, before I was at Guilford Tech, I taught at High Point University, the University of Texas, El Paso. And so, being there, I was always very diligent, you have to do APA, because that's the format of political science, APA. But then when I was at Guilford Tech, well, the English department teaches MLA. And I realized, why am I teaching APA in my American government class when there's maybe one political science student in that whole class? These students are taking for gen ed. Why don't I just teach what English is teaching, uh, MLA? And so I, I realized I evaluated what I was doing a little bit. Um, I also scheduled the library staff. This was a critically underused element uh, at Guilford Tech. But I used the library staff to come and speak to them about the resources, how to use Nexus Lexus, how to use you know, the different resources on campus. And uh, saw a 42% increase in proficiency the next semester after implementation of writing and research-based test flows. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was even something I realized that was, it was really lacking in my area. So, I, I, I'm going to close with kind of this slide in a lot of ways, uh, which is the best and worst practices. James Madison University, I've cited them a couple times. They did a study a few years ago. They've written an article that I linked to one of the uh, earlier slides. It's called Way Pig, Feed Pig, Way Pig. Uh, and it's very simple. It's the idea of assessment. You weigh the pig, the pig weighs a certain amount of weight. You feed the pig, and then after you feed the pig, you weigh the pig again. That's the essence of assessment. Um, it should be noted that James Madison is in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and there's a lot of pig farms around. Uh, <laughs> so that's probably where their motivation is. Um, but what the JMU scholars did was they sent out a survey to 150 assessment leaders national. 
And they said, we want you to send back your institution's best example of how assessment impacted student learning. Best example. Don't send us average. Don't send us the, the two-sentence report. Send us the best example of how assessment impacts student learning. They received 150 examples back. After reviewing those samples, they discovered only nine, six percent, actually demonstrated that assessment changes improved student learning. There's a couple of things to say here postscript. One, they were a little biased in terms of four-year institutions. I would argue community colleges are doing assessment a lot better than four-year institutions are. That's my experience. Because community colleges, and I still say we because a big part of my career was there, we are used to dealing with regulations. We're used to dealing with scrutiny from state legislatures. We're used to having to justify the meager budget that we carve out for ourselves. And so I think we are doing assessment and we're focused a lot more on pedagogy and teaching. And so because of that, I think assessment at community colleges tends to be a little bit more uh, robust. That said, uh, nine out of 150, even among four-year schools, is really sad. But what they discovered was the problem was the best examples of assessment were do a developing continuous improvement plans. So people were assessing, and they were analyzing, and they were developing a continuous improvement plan, but there was no evidence that the continuous improvement plan actually helped students at all. It was just being implemented. Or the continuous improvement plan was how to improve the assessment cycle itself. Oh, well, this assignment didn't work very well, we're gonna develop a new assignment. This rubric was a bust, so we're gonna develop a new one. That sort of thing. That's not impacting student learning. What they discovered was that's nearly impossible to improve student learning through assessment with a poorly structured assessment system. So unless you have everything from the ground up, you have good outcomes, you have good tools, you have good classes to assess, you have faculty who are engaged, you have the, you know, resources to get the data results back. Unless you have all of those things in place, proving and demonstrating improvement of student learning through assessment results or through continuous improvement is nearly impossible. Uh, and they are very, very honest. I've been to one of their presentations at the Regional Accreditation Agency. They're very honest. They said maybe 30% of our programs fit this description, at, even in James Madison. They said well, maybe 30. We work at it every day. We're trying to get better, but maybe 30. Yeah. I think also when you're assessing, you're assessing with a different group of students. So that's also that, not like you're reassessing like the same. And, and that's another really big part, which is, and that goes to that assessment structure, which is, are you just assessing at a senior level or, a, or an exit level course? Mm -hmm. uh, is that the only place you're assessing? Because if so, you're right, you're constantly having a new group. Mm -hmm. At a four year, especially, you have that ability to say, we're assessing at the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 level. We can track these cohorts as they're coming through. We can track growth a little bit better. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a huge, you're always gonna deal with that new population uh, and go, well, listen, We've all had that course that, you know, I used to teach American government back to back to back, 8, 9, 10 a.m., okay? Same courses, same joke, same content, same everything, okay? My 9 a.m. class was a dud, my 8 a.m. class was amazing, my 10 a.m. class was somewhere in the middle. Why? I have no idea. Next semester, totally different, okay? I mean, you just don't know. I mean, so that goes to that element of sometimes you just get a cohort of students who are really strong. You just get a class of students who are exceptional. Sometimes you get a class of students who struggle, and so and it can absolutely impact those things. So, just some brief takeaways from today. Like I said, adopt a singular voice when it comes to talking about assessment. Assessment days can take many forms that are a constant work in progress. Engage faculty in assessment, have a strategy with senior administration, have a partnership with senior administration. An effective continuous improvement can be done with limited staff and resources. It can be done. So. With that, so that yeah. example that you gave, where you talked the four courses back to back, yeah, yeah, yeah. you said one course was really well, and one was really bad. Yeah. Um, let's say you're only teaching one course, mm -hmm. one, and, and in one section, which yeah. a lot of our, at least our department has. Yeah. And so you may start to do assessment, and you may create a continuous um, improvement plan mm -hmm. based on one set of cohort students. Absolutely. And then you find that that 
was either very good or very bad. <laughs> right. So then when you did the assessment next time, it's like, yeah. well, the needle didn't move or it got worse. Right. So how do you take that into consideration? That's a, that's a great question. And I, there's a couple of ways to approach that. One is to say that you should collect a couple semesters worth of data before jumping into the deep end in terms of a really big continuous improvement. The other is something I mentioned earlier, engaging institutional research and ask, what's the composition of my class? What does this look like? You know, what are, what are entrance scores look like? What is percentage in developmental education or something like that? Try to see if there's a way or, or how many credit hours have they already accumulated? That was another part. That was a real big indicator for me a lot of times. I would have students who, uh, it wasn't surprising, the students that did best in my classes were the students who had been in college the longest and having the most experience and the most knowledge. And so they would always achieve very high rates. And sometimes I would have a disproportionate amount of those students in one section. And so sometimes engaging the IR staff, particularly if you do you know, implement some sort of continuous improvement and then see a, a, a regression, to then engage them and say, hey, what's up? Can you just run a quick analysis? For, you know, give me a sense of the composition of these two classes the last two semesters. Maybe there's something else going on here. And isolating that. So that's another idea when you have that really limited case study uh, of doing that. Do you suggest to maybe look at like three semesters worth of data and then create a continuous? I, I think, yeah. Based I, on that? I, I think it just, it depends. I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule. Um, uh, I think you can do two semesters. Just depends on the number of students in each class. Uh, that's another part of it too. If you're teaching really small class sizes, uh, yeah, then probably three, maybe even four semesters it might take to, to really have a firm grasp of this is where our trend line is. This is where our real standard is on, on student achievement. And so, yeah, I think that's uh, uh, fair. I think if I was teaching, you know, for example, some of my bigger classes were 50 students. So even if I was teaching one, probably two semesters worth of data gives me 100 students. That, that's a fair amount of, that's a good amount of end uh, to get to then make a decision about what's working, what's not about 100 students. One other question. Yeah. Um, do you um, approach online courses different from on-campus courses? And if so, what would you give us as tips to you know, do assessments as well as continuous improvement? <laughs> <laughs> on the record, no, I don't tell. I know I don't distinguish, uh, make a distinction between online and face-to-face. -face. You can stop filming now. <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> so, um, on, you know, seriously, I always try to work with the faculty that have a lot of online courses. And having taught Gen Ed, I was in that bucket as well. I had a lot of online courses. Um, and it's a matter of understanding the, the constraints of the LMS to some extent, and going, what does online education look like here versus other places? How built out is it? I'll give you an example. At Florida Southern, we had a system called Genzavar. Um, don't buy it. Uh, so that was not an endorsement. Uh, so, yeah, don't write that down. Uh, the, it was really clunky. The interface for the online courses was really very like 1980s, like prodigy AOL dial up sort of looking stuff. Was not good, was not interactive, and was not a great way to engage students. It was basically, hey, here's a place you can upload files. That was honestly what it was. Where I was at in North Carolina, use Moodle. It's great. You could embed videos. You could embed, you could do all sorts. Of, it was wonderful. And a lot of the more significant LMSs are like that: Canvas, Blackboard. I mean, they're, they're really great tools, great features. So it matters. Whereas online education, when I was at Florida Southern, it was a lot of okay. Well, what do you got? You know, and just kind of working with that and understanding that's probably going to look a little bit different than what you're collecting in the classroom in a more dynamic environment where students have more opportunity to engage and to submit work in a variety of different formats rather than I'm uploading a file. Um, but at Guilford Tech, I really, really, really tried hard to make sure that those assessment processes looked the same, the structure looked the same, the artifacts that submitted were very, very similar, if not the same. Um, and we were also very fortunate at Guilford Tech that we had such a sizable online population that if we had wanted to, we never did this, but if we had wanted to, it was something I kind of toyed around with, we could develop a separate standalone assessment structure for the online courses 
and the face-to-face -face courses because we had a critical mass in both. Uh, and so particularly those gen ed courses where, just to give you a sense, American government, uh, typically 10 to 11 sections per semester, usually five online, five or six face-to-face, uh, -face, so pretty even split. If I wanted to, I could have one assessment strategy for my online, I could have another assessment strategy for my face-to-face. -face. So it, it varies by the institution, that's not the most appealing answer to the question, um, but I think ideally you want to try to align them as close as possible. Yeah. Other questions, yeah? So I teach in humanities. Okay. All people who teach in humanities are adjuncts. Half of them don't live in Southern California. Okay. And all but two of the I hope classes, those people are teaching online. Yes. Okay, yeah. good. All right. and all but That's two, a hell of a community. All, not. Yeah. all but two of the classes each semester are taught, all but only two of the classes each semester are taught face to face. Mm -hmm. So with these challenges involved, how do you how do you energize mm -hmm. those adjuncts who aren't here? Right. They're not here. I think it's a it's a few different ways, I think. One would be developing an online repository uh, of assessment resources and to build a course in some cases, an you know, a course shell for assessment in humanities. So here are the resources that are at your disposal. These are people who are teaching online, so they're already very comfortable you know, pulling resources from offline. Here are um, webinars that you can engage. Here are resources that are ready made in some cases. One of the uh, assessment commons link, that's one of the links on the PowerPoint that I have. It, ten, easily tens of thousands of assessment resources are there. So here's those resources that already exist in order to lighten the load to say you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Here's something that's already being done in humanities mm -hmm. um, with or relates to assessment. Would this work in your class? Here are ideas you know, potentially for assessment moving forward. So I think that's one way to engage them. I think another way of, and this is something we did, we, we experimented with at uh, Florida Southern and at St. Edwards, was we had, uh, or I'm sorry, at St. Edwards, we had enough sections where we would just uh, do a random sample. In other words, not every single section had to submit something every single semester. It was a way of spreading out the workload a little well, here bit. Here we spread it out. Okay. Not every class is SS. Okay. Semester. Okay. Uh, and so I think that's another way to say that, that you, you have some time to catch your breath in between assessments. Um, there's ability to implement continuous improvement without feeling rushed or forced. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, engaging an almost an entirely online or entirely adjunct population without any sort of full-time coordination is a real challenge. And like I said, outside of developing a repository, trying to develop um, techniques, you know, uh, semester techniques to even have online check-ins or online meetings, uh, you know, among the adjunct faculty to collaborate. I mean, it's asking a lot. It's a huge ask for fac adjunct faculty to, to coordinate this on top of what they're doing already. So that, it's not easy, uh, it's, it's not a great answer to your question, uh, but it's just a couple of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I add to that? Please. Bit? So I think um, one of, if I can, if I may suggest something, one of the things I think might be a great opportunity when you only have adjunct faculty who are separated by distance is to do some kind of a like a Google Hangout or FaceTime. Actually, because, we're launching an experiment this week, so yeah. Yeah, because I mean, if they are so far apart, one of the things I think people crave faculty here at this campus is some kind of feeling of connectedness to our departments or to our colleagues. And if we can figure out how to create that, which is something we do all the time in our online classes, I think that would help. And then I, and then I just wanted to tell a story about um, SLOs. I know so many people hate SLOs on this campus. And um, I'm not one of them. I actually kind of like them, although I would never say that in public. But um, this is a safe place. This is a safe <laughs> But I think yeah, what, I the, tape in there. I, <laughs> what I appreciate about it though is it's it's more sort of how it's made me rethink. My SLOs haven't changed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I, you know, way back when, when I was an SL leader, I, I remember saying all the time, well, it's not so much about, you know, I'm the same thing, I'm a social science and I'm a historian, but it's right. not, it's less about content, more about skill, right? Yeah. So between teaching online and thinking about the SLOs, I've now kind of restructured my course quite a bit so that everything is sort of laddered and step by step, it's that whole writing thing. So I've made small assignments step by step to the goals that I wanted mm -hmm. because I was so frustrated I'm not getting success. Like I wanted them to write beautiful papers from the yeah. first month that I had like right. five papers throughout the semester. Yeah. And I was like, okay, obviously they're not taking English, so what right. do I need to do? I have to ladder all the assignments. Mm -hmm. So one week it was all about writing a thesis. Yeah. The next week it was all about writing a paragraph. Yeah. And then the following week, now they're doing analyzing sources. And then the next yeah. time, it's like writing an essay. Yeah. So when I laddered it, oh, it's getting so much better now. So it I just is. wanted to say, it's, yeah. it's, it's how I've restructured it. And it's still demanding, but some people might think it's easier. Although, to, in my opinion, I've just kind of broken up the assignments. It's, it's so interesting to say this because <clears throat> last night, I took an Uber to my hotel, and my Uber driver, I have a way of engaging, I don't know, they just like talking to me, and uh, so I was having a conversation, and he was telling, and I told him, oh, you know, giving a talk at West Los Angeles tomorrow, and he, completely unprompted, goes into this beautiful kind of soliloquy about college is about learning skills, and it's about learning the lessons of life. And it's not about content. And it, this guy's an engineer. Uh, and, you know, he, you know, he's an older gentleman, and he's kind of talking about this. And I couldn't agree more. And it made me think of a very similar experience I went through when I first started doing this as well, which was I started thinking about what do I want my students to know five years from now? Do I, want, do I care that they know what the 21st Amendment is? Not really, OK? <laughs> If that's what they remember, if that's all they remember in five years, I've done something wrong. Okay, if all they if they can just kind of recite a Wikipedia, you know, page. Um, what I want them to be able to do is write well, communicate well orally, think critically, think analytically, problem solve. That's what I want. And so I totally agree. I started rethinking the way that I develop my class. I develop the types of redevelop types of assignments, and it was really funny. I think by the end, I. Recently, I guess maybe a year ago, I looked at some of my old uh, PowerPoints that I had in the classroom, and I was amazed at how, how much less political science content I had by the end than when I started out. You know, when I started out, it was just a fire hose of just content, just coming out like, you know, we're we gonna learn this, we're gonna learn this, we're gonna learn this, and you know, there's this piece of content, this, and by the end, it was, this week we're gonna talk about thesis statements. Next week, we're going to talk about how to communicate orally effectively. Uh, and, and it was all within the confines of developing an assignment for, you know, that was focused on the content, you know, so that they could present. I remember I had an entire day just devoted to putting together a PowerPoint presentation. We looked at what fonts not to use, what font size not to use, what color scheme not to use, how making noise animations every time a bullet point came in is super annoying and unprofessional. And so, those were like the little things that I would end up devoting my time to. But I never would have thought that I would have spent time teaching that when I first started. But when I started thinking about the SLOs of, well, this is where I want my students to end up, then I started to realize, to your point, we're going to layer this when we have to. That's absolutely, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, I want to ask something from the point of view of the student, because when I heard about assessment, I thought, what, how do they feel about it? Yeah. So this student asked in class, does our use of device influence our grade? In other words, if you're sitting in a class and you pull out your device to use it for a reasonable purpose, mm -hmm. um, and the corollary to that is, shouldn't teachers have a policy that says clearly whether or not a device does affect their view of the student and whether or not they can handle information? Yeah. I was always on the more <laughs> liberal side of this policy. Um, I would develop, I used apps in my class. Uh, I developed, like them. Yeah. yeah, I, I exactly. If you're gonna have them, and everybody does, then you might as well use them, uh, because they're not going away. And so, uh, I, I, I absolutely had a policy written in my syllabus. Yeah. Here's the, here's my 
mobile technology policy. And this is what I expect from you, and this is, and I'm going to engage you in your mobile device throughout the semester, and I expect you to have it ready when I ask you for yes. it to be ready. Yes. Um, and That's so, yeah, when I'm polling people in class, on the Poll Everywhere app, or I'm asking you to, you know, go to Google and, and pull up what's the first image you find when you Google this. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, and so I always used to, I used to enjoy doing that um, because my background, my dissertation was on religion and politics, and so um, I would have them Google the Christian right. Because just Google Christian right. And the first five images are all these Photoshop, awful Photoshopped, yeah. uh, you know, Pat Robertson with devil horns and this sort of thing. And it was, this is what people, this is what, you know, when you're Googling this sort of thing, this is the sort of yeah. information you're getting back. And so maybe you want to sift through some of this a little bit more carefully. Um, and so, yeah, those are the sorts of things that I would do. I knew other faculty who were very, very stringent about it. Absolutely, and that's when you're exceptional yeah. and more liberal, yeah. and they want to, how about you guys being consistent? Yeah. So I was, yeah. it's, it's like you don't want that kind of consistency because then you interfere with the curriculum development. You, you do, you do. And I, I think the, the, what I will say is that I was very fortunate at uh, Gilbert Tech in that I was part of the history department but I was the sole political science full-time faculty member, so I could kind of develop my own policies the way I wanted to, and, and it didn't really impact a ton of other people. Um, but I do know, like for example, the history department within just the history faculty, they developed a departmental mobile technology uh, policy. Because they had a couple faculty who liked to engage. And they said, listen, I'm not gonna let you, who says no, we can never use cell phones in class, dictate my policy. Uh, and so they, they, it was a little bit of an argument, but, but they you know, developed one. Be yeah, an institution wide one. <laughs> that's a whole that's a mountain that's too high to climb, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Um, actually, one question and two other things. We, we do have on, uh, online uh, videos of the SLOs that you can share with, with uh, our out of state instructors. Oh, great. Okay. And I also do uh, online SLO huddles using Google Hangout. Cool. And I get um, instructions <laughs> from all over state. So I can send you that. It's a simple sign up form. They just click a button saying the time that they want to join. And they love it. I get some of the people who log in saying, oh, I saw the videos. Or I, they'll yeah. log in, and I tell them before they log in to go see the videos. Hmm. One person logged in. I said, okay, well, what's your question? She's like, oh, I don't have a question. I'm like, okay, so I'm the hell? Like, oh, I don't need any help. It just said after I watched the videos, the long video. So, and she said the videos were so thorough, I don't have any questions. I That's awesome. It. Yeah, so I was just to let you know. Another thing I thought of as, as we were sitting here, yeah. I don't know if everybody would be down for it, the idea of having that that sort of uh, sample uh, dialogue between faculty mm -hmm. to come up with a rubric. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be, I'm, and this is, I guess, for everyone in the room, if you guys would be willing to participate, I can create a sample one, and I was just thinking of something, if anybody can with something better, we can assess the stack table. Right? <laughs> come, up, come up with a fun rubric. Yeah, absolutely. That, what would be our rubric for snacks at yeah. faculty meetings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah. I can, more protein. Right, there you go, more protein. And your reason why we need more protein, you know, so, like, great. Everyone yeah. has to have coffee. If you can't have coffee, you're not even going to get graded. Right. If there's only water, that's a, that's a zero. That's a zero. <laughs> that's not so, proficient. That's mutiny. <laughs> that's mutiny. <mutant. laughs> that means you didn't want to have a meeting. Um, but if anybody was willing to just chime in on that, and then I can yeah. condense something and we can present it. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking of, when you were talking about having, uh, when the two departments or one department sort of collaborating with other looking mm -hmm. for the solution for yeah. that. Would that create, uh, in essence, an SLO for the other department as well? It wouldn't create an SLO for them, but it was because of, in a lot of, what, so that, in that particular case, it was a history working with communication. And so it didn't create a new SLO for communication, but what it did was it allowed for and in, what, in reality, what happened was that history really just borrowed the resources that were already being used by communication and the strategies that were already developed by communication. They, they just never talked to each other about this sort of thing before. And so just seeing, just getting 
the PowerPoint, just getting the lesson plans, getting, you know, seeing the way in which the communication faculty caught up communication gotcha. um, was the learning process that the history department went through. So it didn't create any additional work for communication, but it was it was a great opportunity for them to collaborate. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I think what I was thinking of. Oh, cool. I had sort of in my mind had already adapted what you said in the model in my mind okay. to present because we get a lot of students in film okay. who, who are going into film production, ah, okay. but they have very poor writing skills. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so on the students' end, as opposed to yep. your example was on the yep. faculty end. Right, I mean, right. There's, I'm thinking in my head there was already some sort of dialogue I could have with the maybe the library, the writing skills department, yeah. um, English. Absolutely. And, that's and abs that's a great collaboration idea. I mean to to, <laughs> to work with either academic support in terms of either writing center or, or you know what right. or to work with the English department to go, how are you teaching this? What are your best strategies? What are uh, yeah, right, you know right. what are your best practices and then how can we, how can uh, we help each other? you know yeah how can we help each other exactly and I, and I don't think that would create it, like I said, that's more of an information sharing right, session. But, it's yeah. not so much creating more work for English either. It's just them sharing best strategies with you so that you can go back and implement it into your program. Uh, and so I think you know the more collaboration you can get, like I said, the more eyes you can get on assessment within your program from other people, right, the right. better it's going to get. Um, because I, I never, it never ceases to amaze me how differently we all think about assessment uh, and how differently we all think about solving problems. Uh, I mean, I would have never in a million years thought of developing a ride share program to help students get touched. Right, right. I just wouldn't have. And that was the first thing Don thought of. We saw that. Pretty students are having a problem getting class. Oh, we'll just pick them up. Like it was nothing. Like it was just, oh, I'm stupid for not thinking of that. Like, you know, it was, it was amazing. And, uh, and there are certain things, I remember one time he was complaining about something, and I said, well, why don't you just do it this way? He goes, well, how, you know, well, how'd you even think of that? I wouldn't have. That's where we collaborate. We talk with each other. Right? It, it, the more eyes you can get on this, it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't feel alone on an island when you're doing assessment. It really should be a community effort and a group effort, and you should be stealing or borrowing from each other heavily in that regard.